Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to C4C Apologetics. I'm glad you ju joined us and tuned in. Today, we have another guest interview. This one is probably going to be a little more uh, common to you than some of the other ones that I've had. He's none other than the Dr. Jason Lyle from the Biblical Science Institute. So, Dr. Lyle, just thank you for spending some time with us today. My pleasure. Thanks for the invite. So, I, I've been following you for quite some time now, at least about 10 years from the moment I got saved back in 09. Uh, something about your ministry and, and specifically ICR and what Henry Morris and John Morris have uh, done over there with that you know, ministry. And what I love about you is just how you're able to take the technical information, break it down into layman terms so that people can understand. But other things that I love about you is you're not afraid to engage some very uh, well-reasoned, very uh, highly intellectual people, such as, for instance, you know, Hugh Ross. I remember seeing a debate you've had with Hugh Ross years back, and I believe you teamed up with uh, Ken Ham as well in an old universe debate also. But one of the most fascinating things I've learned under your lectures is the fact of what's called the Mandelbrot set. And so I don't want to get into it right now, but I'm going to ask you a question near the end of this interview as far as if you can break that down to us. And so I just really glad to have you on here and everything. But before we go any farther, would you mind sharing a little bit about yourself, who you are, and then what is the Biblical Science Institute? Yeah, um, I'm Jason Lyle. I, um, the, the most important thing about me is I'm a Christian. I am saved by God's grace, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I, I have an interest in science, always have since I was very young, and in particular, the field of astronomy and physics, astrophysics. So I went and got my PhD in astrophysics from the University of Colorado at Boulder, and uh, I've had an enjoyable career in that. And as soon as I got my PhD, I immediately went into Christian ministry, because for me, it's not good enough just to show people how the universe works. I want to point them to God, the uh, architect of the universe, the one who upholds it by the word of his power. I, uh, about three years ago, I started a ministry called the Biblical Science Institute, and it's designed to fill a niche that I think other ministries, I mean, there, there are some great Christian ministries out there, don't get me wrong, and I, I was very blessed to work with Answers Genesis for over seven years, and uh, I, I still uh, keep in touch with some of my friends there. It's a great ministry, and they're, they're really good at reaching families, and, and they've got programs for kids. I, I feel called to, to kind of go a little bit more in-depth than than would be typical with some of these other ministries. Not, and not, not so much for the PhDs, but maybe for students who are studying to get a PhD. That's kind of my niche, I think. And so that's why I founded the Biblical Science Institute. But we have, we have basic articles, and then we have ones that are a little bit more in depth. And we have those on our website, biblicalscienceinstitute.com. I have a podcast. Um, I, I recently, I did a podcast with uh, Hugh Ross, actually. We kind of debated a little bit. And uh, I'm, I'm posting my comments on my own debate with him there so on our on our uh, website so yeah so that's kind of the the gist of it wonderful thank you about that uh definitely one of the things because you were with icr for a while too weren't you mm -hmm. and, and that's one thing i've learned like you said there's all sorts of ministries specifically creationism ministries as well and and some of them are a lot more technical than others and i love your approach to that as well just being able to take the technical aspect which is I, I find more into icr than answers in genesis they're both wonderful but then again being able to break that down and if i remember correctly i've the topic we're going to talk about is craters and where do they fit in a young earth model and i think it was you that i've heard it said before that you don't like calling it correct me if i'm wrong young earth creationism but you'd rather call it biblical creationism because that's what we believe the word of God actually espouses and yeah. so today the topic is going to be and, and it's a good question where do these craters fit in a young earth if the earth is only about 6,000 years old give or so a few years so brother before we actually go into these harder questions if you will I'm going to start out probably with one of the hardest that you'll probably be faced with, okay? Right off the bat, are we good with that? Mm -hmm. What is astrophysics? How did you get involved? And were you always fascinated as a kid with astrophysics? Told you it was a tough one. Yeah. Astrophysics is the study of the universe, anything that's beyond Earth, really. So it's a very large field. It's the largest field, really, other than, I guess, theology, which is studying God, the creator of the universe. 
but um, it's something that I've always been interested in. Yeah, since I was a little kid, uh, we would go through our, our local library and, and uh, I'd get all the age appropriate books on astronomy. I'm sure I've read them all in, in their little local library there. And uh, I, I like all sciences. I like biology, I like chemistry. I, I, I really dabbled in chemistry for a while and, and considered going into that as my major. But I just also, I just always had a special love for the, the universe. There's something about outer space that's, it's kind of abstract. It's large beyond our, our imagination. It has incredible beauty built into it. And even, even now, I still appreciate it. I did when I was a kid, and I still appreciate these wonderful pictures that you see of outer space and the different colors of stars and the nebulae and uh, how wonderful and, and what a large canvas that the Lord has painted on. And so it's, uh, it's been something that's always excited me. Uh, so yeah, even when I was a little kid, I, I was interested in it. And I had no doubts going through school that I would be a scientist. There was just no doubt about it. Uh, I dabbled again with chemistry and, and physics, but astrophysics is really my, where my heart's really at, I think. Okay, well, that's wonderful. I know you're doing a, a solar system uh, bit, if you will, on uh, Biblical Science Institute. And I don't know if you've touched it yet, uh, but I'm wondering if you will, and this wasn't part of any of the interview, but the Oort cloud. Mm -hmm. It just always fascinates me how skeptics, cynics, atheists, they want empirical data and empirical evidence to be able to believe something but yet, if you were to go to NASA's website right now, it says the Oort cloud is a predicted, un unobservable, theoretical cloud out there at the edge of the solar system that we've never seen that's shooting in comets and everything. It's a comet producing factory. And so it's just, it's amazing that the depths that people will go to professing themselves wise to become fools. And so, but really get to the basics of the whole creationism evolution debate. Can you go over the various evolutionary views such as day age theory, gap theory, progressive creation, theistic evolution, and, and how do they fall short of what the God, what God's word actually says? Okay. Uh, day age is one uh, mechanism that people use it's to interpret the scriptures in such a way as to allow for deep time, to allow for the billions of years. And the, the position is that the, the days of creation were not days in a literal 24-hour uh, sense, but were in fact vast ages, perhaps hundreds of millions of years each. And Hugh Ross, for example, holds that view. Uh, it, it could be held by either progressive creationists or theistic evolutionists. Anyone who, needs, who feels like they need the deep time, uh, and, it, and it, of course it fails because when you look at the Hebrew words in that context, the Hebrew word for day is yom, and in the context of Genesis, it is a 24-hour day. Uh, th there's an error in reasoning where people will find a, a rather obscure meaning uh, or a, a less common meaning for a word, and they'll shove that into a context where it cannot mean that. And that's the unwarranted expansion of an expanded semantic field. And that's the, the error that the day age folks commit. There's no doubt in Genesis, those are ordinary days. In fact, our work week is based on it. Exodus 20 verses eight through 11 tells us that our work week is based on God's creation week. And it uses the same word for day there, yamim in the plural form, which is always ordinary days anyway. So the day age theory really fails, but it's popular because people really feel like they need to get the billions of years in there somehow. Uh, for those who would recognize, no, there's no doubt the days are ordinary days. That's grammatically solid but they still feel like they got to get the millions of years in there. There's the gap theory. And the gap theory is the idea that there's an enormous gap of time in between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. And they would like to say that the days of creation are God sort of, they're, they're, they're literal days, but they're God recreating a world that, that was very old. And so Genesis 1 is, Genesis 1-1 includes all this sort of prehistory. God created the heaven and the earth. And then they'd like to think in millions of years later, the earth became without form and void. Uh, you really can't translate it that way in that context. In the Hebrew grammar, uh, verse 2 uses a construction called a vav disjunctive, where we have and followed by a non-verb in the original Hebrew word order, which is not always the same as English, but and the earth, okay, uh, vaha eretz. And whenever you have that, that indicates that that is a comment on what came before it, and so or a clarification, an explanation of what came before it. And so my point is you can't put a gap of time in between verse 1 and verse 2, because verse 2 doesn't follow in time. Verse 2 is an explanation of verse 1. It's a clarification, because if you just had Genesis 1-1, and that's all you knew, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, you might think that God instantly created the earth already as it is today, with life 
with oceans separated from land and so on. Verse 2 is clarifying, no, that's not the case. When God initially created the earth, it was without form and void. It didn't have the shape that it has today. Uh, the oceans and land were all apparently mixed together. It's a, it's a water ball initially. There's no life on it. And, uh, and then the rest of Genesis is, is, explains that God took six days to shape that initially shapeless earth into, well, r- approximately what it is today, not exactly, but something like that. So that's why the, uh, the gap theory uh, fails. Uh, it fails on the basis of Hebrew grammar. Now, the rest of Genesis and God did this and God did that and followed by a verb in the Hebrew word order, which is, which is consecutive. That, that, that does indicate a sequence, but not verse two. So you can't put time in there. Uh, we have theistic evolution. We have progressive creation. Theistic evolution is the idea that, that D- Darwinian evolution is basically true, but it's something that God used to get the life uh, on earth. And so we're genuinely descended from uh, an ape-like ancestor. Uh, there are some theistic evolutionists who would say, no, human beings are a special creation, but all the other life is evolved. That's one variation of that. And then there's progressive creation, which says that no God supernaturally created the organisms, but he did it over billions of years. So God created certain organisms, you know, billions of years ago and then slaughtered them off, created more, slaughtered them off, created more, slaughtered them off. Both progressive creation, theistic evolution have one, well, they have several problems, but one that is just devastating to the gospel. And that is they both put death before sin. If you got organisms dying billions of years ago, you've got death before Adam was created because we all agree Adam doesn't go back billions of years ago. And that means that death was not introduced into the world as a result of Adam's sin. That's a problem because the Bible teaches that death is the penalty for sin. It's the wages of sin. And you say, well, is that literally true? Is that just spiritual death? Jesus died physically on the cross to pay for our sins. And so uh, that that gets immediately undermined with either a theistic evolution view or a progressive creation view. And I should point out that neither of those views can be reconciled with Scripture. There's just no way you could read the Bible exegetically taking from it what it says and come away thinking, yeah, that's, that's Genesis is teaching that God evolved the animals. No, he created them. He didn't create them over billions of years. He created them in six days and then gave Adam charge over them. And because Adam sinned, our sin affects the world because Adam was in charge of the world. So that's why even animals have to die as a result of Adam's sin because of the nature of authority. So those are basically the, the views and the, the major problems with them. You know, it's amazing, too, because when I, I don't understand why people try to reconcile evolution within Scripture, because even if you look at the evolutionary timetable and the order of events of which things happen, it doesn't align with Genesis chapter one and the days and the orders of events, regardless of if it's millions of years or days. The order, the sequence is completely out of whack. Then the other thing, at least, you know, my view is, OK, so and I don't understand why, again, they want to fit uh the evolution of man in scripture, because if you're saying mankind got too close to the, the homo sapiens sapiens species, if you will, that was maybe about a hundred thousand years ago before that evolution. But yet we can trace from genealogy within scripture, how far it was with Adam and Seth, and then all the way up to Solomon and then the temple and then all the way up to Jesus Christ. And you can still get a 6,000 year range just based on creation of man and so it just baffles me how they try to plug all this into an evolutionary timetable but Mm -hmm. what are some strongest evidences you believe and you have found uh, for a earth or a universe because really they believe the earth is 4.6 billion and the universe is 13 billion years old what are some of the strongest evidences you see that the earth and the universe are about 6,000 years old well, the best evidence is the Bible. We have we have the record of the origin of the universe, and that trumps any kind of uh, scientific guesswork. Uh, p- people rightly have confidence in science. We should, in terms of its ability to understand the present operation of the universe. When it comes to reconstructing the past, that's not really the purpose of science. That's not to say that you can't make some guesses about the past using science. I think you can, but they're not testable and repeatable in the present. And that's the power of science is its testability, its repeatability, uh, it's observability, and you can't do any of that with the past because it's gone. Uh, that being said, I think we can, uh, I think we do find a lot of evidence in the universe that is very consistent with its recent creation as opposed to billions of years ago, a few thousand years ago instead, and that is very difficult to explain any other, 
any other way. And a lot of times people misunderstand how we do these kind of age estimates. But I find uh, one of the best approaches is what's called a reductive ad absurdum, where I assume the starting points of my opponent and show that it leads to an inconsistency. The reason that secularists tend to think in terms of billions of years uh, in order to get life on earth and in order to get the universe the way it is, is because they're assuming naturalism and uniformitarianism. They're assuming the universe was not supernaturally created, but that it somehow came about by natural laws and that, that the present is the key to the past, that, that, that the kinds of the, the rates at which processes take place today is kind of generally true for all times. That's uniformitarianism. And I would reject both of those. I believe in a supernaturally created universe, and I believe in that there are catastrophes that have affected Earth's surface uh, at a much faster rate than they would happen today. But for the sake of argument, I can assume naturalism and uniformitarianism and show that in many cases, it, leads, it still leads to a young universe, or at least one that's much younger than the billions of years. Uh, one that I think is very powerful is uh, carbon, carbon-14. A lot of people have the impression that carbon dating gives millions of years. It never does. Uh, carbon dating is based on the transformation of C14. Most carbon is C12. It's got the six protons, six neutrons. But there's a version of, of carbon that has two, it has two extra neutrons, so it's C14, and it's unstable, which means it will spontaneously decay into nitrogen. Most carbon, C12 is stable. C14 will decay into nitrogen. With a, it's got a half-life of about 5,700 years, and so that gives you kind of a timetable for how quickly it decays. And we find C14 in just about everything that has carbon in it. You can take a chunk of coal that's deep down, in, in, well insulated from cosmic rays that are what produced the C14 in the first place. You can find a chunk of coal and, and you, will, you will find every time it's got C14 in it. Every chunk of coal we've ever measured has C14 in it. And that would not be the case if it were really hundreds of millions of years old, as, as secularists believe, because the C14 would have decayed a long time ago. It just decays too quickly. Uh, you, we've even taken... Um, Fossils, even dinosaur fossils, if there's enough carbon left in them, fossils permineralize, other minerals come and move in. But if there's sufficient carbon left in them, you can carbon date them, and we get, we get thousands of years every time. We never get the billions of years. That's just one example. Uh, the rate at which Earth's magnetic field is decaying, we can measure that, and it's dropping. We've been able to measure that for almost two centuries, and it is dropping. And it appears to be an exponential decay, and if you run that backwards, you find that the Earth's, the strength of the magnetic field would have been about 20 times stronger at creation. It's pretty good. Your compass would work even better than it does now. Get extra protection from cosmic rays. That'd be kind of nice. But um, if you run it back 60,000 years, the Earth's magnetic field would be stronger than that of a neutron star, which would be enough to rip the atoms of your body apart. So, and that's, that's, we're not even into the millions of years. You know, it's just 60,000 years. So that's, a, that's an, a generous upper limit just based on the decay. And, and granted, we think that during the flood, the magnetic field was disturbed and probably flipped and so on. But that just drains the energy even faster, we expect. So that's, um, that's a, I think, a very strong evidence. There's all kinds of stuff like that in the Earth and the solar system. Uh, the, the rate at which um, dust is eliminated from the solar system by the Poynting-Robertson effect, for example, we should, we should not have any dust left in the solar system uh, if, if it were billions of years old, because the, the way this, the sun um, radiation affects the dust particles, they're, they're orbiting, and so the light comes in at an angle and they end up spiraling inward there's also the Yarkovsky effect, which can make them go either way, depending on how they're spinning. But the, the long and short of it is the dust would be gone. And we have plenty of dust in the solar system. And you can even see it if you get out to a really dark rural area. Uh, it's best around springtime after sunset. As soon as, just, just after twilight, you'll see this blue band along the ecliptic, which is the path that all the planets are in. And that's dust. You're seeing dust reflecting sunlight. So there's plenty of dust left in the solar system. Comets, uh, you mentioned the Oort cloud earlier. That's a, that's a rescuing device to try and get around the fact that we have comets, which can't last billions of years. In that's fact, another term I love of you, rescuing device. Rescuing device. Well, yeah, I got, that from, I got that from Greg Bonson, and uh, he, he used that as a, as a sort of a layman version of a technical term. But uh, yeah, it's an auxiliary hypothesis. It's designed to explain away something that is apparently contrary to your, your worldview, your way of thinking. So would that be like an atheistic out of the gaps thing? Oh yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it is. So comets can't last billions of years. And so they're obvious, you know, the secular civil are obviously is an Oort cloud generating new ones, a comet generator. There's no evidence for that, but uh, it must be there because we know the solar system is billions of years old. Well, you don't really know that. You don't really know that. So they're, they're, those are just a few. That was wonderful. Thank you. Now, I do know, and this is one, I know you've had something on it, 
I've tried reading the technical article on it. I've tried to understand it. I couldn't, but I trust it. One of the common objections to a young earth is the distant starlight problem. And if I remember correctly, you had a theory, a pretty good theory as far as how can we have the quote unquote distant starlight, if it's 186,000 miles per second is the light of speed, speed of light, how can the earth and the universe still only be 6,000 years old? Could you possibly explain uh, your rationale for still a young earth, a young universe uh, in layman terms? That's the trick, that last part. Uh, yes, I can explain it. It's just hard to do it in layman terms. In fact, I wrote a book called The Physics of Einstein. If you understand the physics of Einstein, the answer to this to starlight is very easy. You, you, you can immediately see that there are, there are ways in which of defining what constitutes synchronized clocks that would allow light to get here instantaneously from anywhere in the universe. So it's not a problem if you know the physics of Einstein. The problem is most people don't know anything about the physics of Einstein. So I actually wrote a book on that topic called The Physics of Einstein. And it goes through and it, it gives you enough of the understanding of the physics to understand the solution to distant starlight. But uh, in so basically one of the things that Einstein found is that uh, space, time, lengths, are not as objective as we think. They, they, they depend on how you're moving or, or perhaps where you're located in the universe, depending on how things are set up. And so one person might measure an event as, as lasting two seconds. Another person might measure the same event as lasting four seconds or, or even a year, depending on, on how they're moving. So there's this phenomenon called time dilation. And that makes it impossible to, to synchronize clocks separated by distance to everyone's satisfaction. Is that, so how do we know? Is that sort of what we see with the astronauts in space and how time changes a little differently? The effect is very small for astronauts in orbit around the Earth. It's very tiny. And um, it, it, there is an effect, but it's, it's almost immeasurably small. It would take atomic clocks to measure it. But if you're moving close to the speed of light, the effects become very, very severe. And it turns out it's, it's a steep function. You have to get up to 14% the speed of light to have a 1% time dilation. So, to have, so two clocks ticking, ticking differently by just 1%, you have to be moving at 14% speed of light. So it's only when you, but when you get really close to the speed of light, the, the effect becomes just enormous. And um, well, anyway, that led Einstein to another realization that uh, two clocks how do we synchronize them? Okay, we got two clocks. How, how do you know if clocks are synchronized? Meaning they read the same time at the same time. Now, if they're right next to each other, it's obvious. I say, you know, there's noon and that one's noon. Yeah, they, they look the same. They're, they're synchronized. But if they're separated by distance, you have this problem because in order to see what that clock is reading, light has to go from, from there to here, you see. And so their question becomes, well, how long does that take? And most people think, well, we know what the speed of light is. We don't know what the speed of light is on one leg of a trip. We only know what the round trip speed of light is. If I were to send a light beam off to a mirror, bring it back, divide the, or take the total distance, divide it by the total time, that would be an average speed. But there's no guarantee that it goes the same speed that way as it comes this way. And people would say, why would it be different? And I don't know, but you can't just assume that it's the same because wouldn't that be nice? Uh, in science, we have, to, we have to study these things. And so what, one of the things that Einstein realized is that if two clocks are separated by a distance, one thing you could do to, to synchronize your clocks is you could assume that the speed of light's the same out as it is in. And so you send out your pulse at exactly noon. It goes, together, say it, takes a, it goes over there and reflects back, and it takes two seconds to make the whole trip. You could assume that it took one second to go out and one second to come back. And therefore, you should set the other clock to 12001 as soon as it receives that light pulse. You can do that. But if someone else is moving relative to you and they do exactly the same experiment, they will get a different result. And so this leads to what's called the relativity of simultaneity. If one observer says these two clocks are synchronized, and here's my, here's my method, another person who's moving using the same method will say, no, they're not synchronized. Here's how you synchronize them. And he'll get a different result than the first person. And so what that means is there are different ways of declaring what, what, what does now mean at a distance. And depending on how you do it, there, there are what they call synchrony conventions, different methods for synchronizing clocks, different conventions. And one of them is, I call it an anisotropic synchrony convention. And in that convention, light 
we define synchronized clocks such that when light, when it's moving toward an observer, is actually instantaneous. It takes no time at all for the light to get from there to here. And if you, if you read the literature on this topic, you'll find that that is not only perfectly compatible with the physics of Einstein, Einstein himself defended that, that the one-way speed of light is merely a convention, something we get to choose, and that tells us how to synchronize clocks. But you'll find that all ancient cultures implicitly assumed that light took no time to get from there to here. And so that would be the ancient convention and the Bible being written for all times, not just 21st century America. Uh, that would seem to be the convention that God used. And so in that convention, it takes light no time at all to get from there to here. So it's, it's a physics thing. I know it's not, it's counterintuitive because people think that time is absolute and space is absolute, but they're not. And so if you, if you study Einstein, you'll see that in fact, you can get light from there to here instantaneously using this uh, anisotropic synchrony convention. Yeah, I know, I know. Like I, I wrote the book because it does it does take a while to build up right. knowledge of space and time to, to yep. do it. So, yeah. I'm gonna have to get that one, but I know we have some thinkers on the channel as well, so uh, they'll definitely gonna appreciate how how you got into that. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna test your knowledge on geology a bit. Oh boy! So, All right. <laughs> so and I'm actually gonna read this because it's somewhat like a almost a paragraph. Okay, so. Another objection besides distant starlight to a young universe is the existence of craters, not only on the moon, but the remnants of craters here on Earth. And this is the main topic of this uh, video. I have personally studied out myself and realized craters are only one of like numerous uh, theories on how the dinosaurs would extinct with, kid you not, and you can most likely agree that some scientists believe that they've gassed themselves to death, the greenhouse gas, if you know what I mean. However, when I'm researching the craters in my own study, I found that only a small percentage were actually impact craters. That a lot of them were actually, if I pronounce it correctly, Mars craters, M-A-A-R-S craters. Do you know how many of Earth craters are actually Mars craters rather than impact uh, craters and what the difference between the two are? Um, I don't know. I don't know the ratio. Um, this is something that I, lo I looked into it years ago, and I'm probably not up to speed on the latest, but uh, the, the Earth is, first of all, there are not a lot of craters on the Earth. All of the solar system, all of these large, solid solar system bodies are very heavily cratered with two exceptions, Jupiter's inner moon, Io or Eo, and Earth. Those are the two that lack substantial crater. Earth has some, and some of them are impact craters. There are other ways of making craters. Uh, volcanoes will do it. And to me, as a non-geologist, it's not obvious. I, I went and hiked uh, when I, I had the opportunity to visit Hawaii uh, several years ago, and I hiked a crater there. There's the Diamond Head Crater, and it's wonderful. And, and to me, it looked kind of like an impact crater, but it's not. It's a volcanic crater. Uh, it, it's interesting, too, this idea that uh, you know, the craters are the results of impact. That's relatively new. Even by the 1950s, they were still, I think that was around the time where they made the shift that craters on the moon are probably impact craters rather than volcanic, which is kind of interesting. So it just goes to show you that, that science is, especially when it comes to reconstructing past events, which is outside the purview of science proper, uh, it's really tentative. Some of the conclusions are really tentative. But I have found that, uh, yes, there are some craters on the earth. There's some craters that are ancient that are, perhaps um, perhaps even pre-flood, but very few. And a lot of the things that people think are craters are not, like the, the, um, the one in the Yucatan, the Chicxulub, so-called Chicxulub crater. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, 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 Dr. Tim Clary, who's a geologist, he's been studying that. And he says, there, it's not an impact crater. There's no way it's an impact crater because it's not even round, first of all, if you look, look at the shape of it. So a lot of these things that are claimed to be impact craters are not. The, the Behringer crater is an impact crater. I've been there. There's good evidence for that. We found some of the material. I have a piece of the, the rock that made it, actually. A little piece, it's an iron-type meteorite that, that made it. And uh, so there are some, but they're very few. And so the question is, how do we account for that in a creation worldview? How do we account for that in a secular worldview? Definitely. And while you're on the craters, it's fascinating that you actually have a piece of that meteor meteorite that created that it'd be pretty interesting to have and take a look at but how are scientists able to try and date 
the craters. Okay, so say if it truly is an impact crater, what is the method of trying to determine how old that impact happened? There aren't any good ones, uh, frankly. Uh, it, it depends on things like, they'll look at things like erosion, how much is it eroded in time, but that, that assumes you have to know something about the rate of erosion in that area. Uh, Behringer Crater, there's not a lot of, I mean, it's in a fairly dry area. There's not a lot of precipitation there. So it, it, it doesn't erode at the same rate as other ones. Uh, they could look at the, the rocks in the surrounding area and try to, try to guesstimate it from that. But there really isn't a good way of, of dating craters. Don't, don't let anybody fool you there. Well, we know this crater is X number of years old. No, you don't. You don't know that. Uh, you don't know when it happened. You just know that it's there. It totally. I mean, because then you got the problem of trying to figure out where you're going to start. Like you say, uniformitarianism is really just the, uh, it's the key to the evolutionary timetable and just fitting everything in. You're looking at the decay rates and everything else, but that's something that's always fascinated. How, how can they tell when that crater actually happened? And, they can't. And interestingly, yeah. I, I did look into this specifically for the Behringer crater because that's, since I've got a piece of it, that's a particular interest to me. And, you know, there, there are a wide range of dates for when they think this happened. And, and they're, of course, they're, they're too old. Most of them are pre-flood. So you know, this is obviously a post-flood crater. You wouldn't have it. Flood would wipe out any uh, previous craters or at least fill them in with sediment. Um, no, it's post-flood. But there are legends of the Native Americans seeing that event happen. <laughs> so it's not, it's not millions of years ago. So it's kind of interesting. Legends and, and cultural tales, it's like the flood of Noah's day. It, it, it's amazing if one were to look at all the cultural legends around the globe, not just the area, but around the globe, that they're all very similar to what scripture records and everything. I just want to backtrack for a quick second. Uh, mm -hmm. You had mentioned the magnetic pull a, a while back as far as proof of young earth creationism, biblical creationism and everything. And it, it, if it's my understanding they like to say that magnetic poles have flipped numerous times in the past. And that's how they get away from the magnetic pole decay rate and everything. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, if the magnetic pole flipped and it took thousands of years for it to get back up to the strength to protect us from the, the solar rays, what kind of detrimental effect would it have on life on Earth? Yeah, it, 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 it could have a detrimental effect. It's perhaps not as shocking or severe as people might think because it, it, in the process of flipping, it's temporarily zero, but that's just the dipole component. You can have sort of bits of magnetic field elsewhere. You can have quadrupole moments and so on. So it's not totally zero, but it is, it is weaker substantially when it's in the middle of, of flipping. We do think it flipped. There's good evidence for that. But the problem is there's no mechanism to cause it today. You need motion. You need rapid motion to flip the magnetic field. And since it's in Earth's core, you'd think, well, you'd need motion deep down. We think that plate tectonics had an effect. Uh, the, most creationists believe in plate tectonics, and we believe that the, the continents were together before the flood, something like Pangaea, and then they've been pushed apart. Uh, they were pushed apart during the flood fairly rapidly to pretty close to their present positions. And you have the, the ocean floor subducting. We think the ocean floor has been completely replaced. There's evidence that the, the ocean floor, none of it is original. It was totally like a conveyor belt. It was completely replaced at the time of the flood. And so you have these motions and they go pretty, pretty deep down into the mantle. That's gonna temporarily disrupt that current, kind of cause rapid uh, flipping of the magnetic field. There's good evidence of this. The, the, if you look at the spreading of the ocean floor, when, when rocks harden, they can, they can kind of lock in the direction of the magnetic field at the time the rock formed. And if you go along the magnetic floor sideways from the, from the mid-Atlantic ridge and go outward, they flip. The, 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 so the rocks record opposite polarity. So when the, when the continents are being pushed apart, which we think happened rapidly, the magnetic field must have flipped and that must have happened rapidly. The interesting thing is if you go down, they also flip. And that, and that, that would only make sense if this happened rapidly because the top layer cools and freezes in the magnetic field there, but the layer below it's still warm. And so it has, and so by the time it cools, the magnetic fields flip. That would only happen if they were flipping rapidly. And so I think there's very good evidence that the magnetic field has flipped. It's flipped rapidly. I've done some other research on this involving uh, cosmic ray production because it, when the magnetic field flips, you get increased cosmic ray production because it's weaker. 
and you get more cosmic rays and that affects C14 calibration. So I've been, I've been looking into this a little bit. I even constructed some uh, computer simulations to simulate how cosmic rays interact with the magnetic field. And if you if, assume that the magnetic field never flipped, then you don't get the current amount of uh, C14. But if you assume that beginning at the flood year, it flipped rapidly, you do get the current amount of C14 in nature so that it's consistent with the biblical time scale if you allow flipping. My, my secular colleagues believe that the magnetic field somehow is able to recharge itself during this flipping phase. And that's the rub. I can't find any evidence of that, that a magnetic field would naturally uh, recharge itself in the process of flipping because the sun's magnetic field flips regularly. But that's because it's, it rotates differentially. The Earth can't do that because the Earth's mostly solid. Well, I mean, there's, it's, there's magma in the core. But as far as we can tell, the Earth rotates as a solid body. And so there's no, there's no mechanism to cause the flipping today. And there's no evidence that such flipping could somehow recharge the magnetic field. Quite interesting. Quite fascinating. Now, you had made mention that impact craters, I mean, there are legitimate existence of impact craters here on Earth. What does that do to a view of a 6,000 year old earth? Does it cause a problem? And if not, how from God's word can we articulate or show where these impact craters came? Now you had made mention uh, some you believe may be pre-flood and, and then some that are at the flood. So could you articulate views and everything what you believe is the most uh, biblical? Yeah, I, it, it's, it'd, it'd be very difficult to identify, but maybe not impossible, to identify pre-flood craters because they would be filled in with sediment at this point. But th there may be some. Any that we see on the surface today are post-flood. So Behringer Crater, obviously post-flood. Anything that you see on the surface would have to be post-flood because the flood would have filled it in with sediment or, or even wiped it out. Uh, there aren't that many. There, uh, I mean, depending on who you ask, how many crate that's that's an ongoing discussion too and, and different creationists have looked into that wayne spencer is really hot on this topic he, he's looked into cratering rates and things like that but however you however you look at it there are far fewer craters on earth than there are on the moon on mars on venus on mercury on any of the worlds except except io the explanation for io or eo is uh, it's it's the most volcanically active world in the solar system when voyager 2 flew past jupiter and and past the moon um, IO, it spotted nine volcanoes going off simultaneously. And so there's so much material that's been recirculated that, that IO has been completely resurfaced and is perfectly consistent with the biblical time scale, by the way. So it's been, even since creation, it's been resurfaced. So if it had any craters to begin with, which I think it did, they've been erased by all this volcanic activity. Now, what about the Earth? Well, a couple possibilities. Why is the Earth different? Why is it unique? Why does it lack substantial cratering? The secular view, by the way, we all agree, the Earth has far fewer craters than the other worlds. Uh, the secular view is tectonic activity, geological activity on Earth has erased the initial cratering. And that works. But another possibility is that the Earth never had substantial cratering. And I tend to lean that way. I think the Earth was made by a different process than God made all the other planets. Earth's made on day one. God spoke it into existence. It's initially water. So how could it have craters on it? It's water. And then God creates the land and so on. Now, the other objects that God created, we don't, the Bible doesn't give us a lot of details on how he did that. We know they were made on day four. Um, he made the sun, the moon, the stars also, uh, the uh, star, star, Kochab. Uh, that would include planets as well, because in, the, in the, the, the Hebrew term would include that. So they're also made on day four and the moon. Uh, my, my view would be that God probably used process in making those objects, and the craters are the last bit of material that God gathered to create those objects, all on day four, not a problem for God. So God might have created the material for the planets on day one, but he didn't actually collect them into these uh, objects until day four, and the craters are the last bits of material that God collected. The interesting thing is whether you believe in creation or this creation time scale or the secular time scale, everybody agrees that the cratering rate must have been much faster in the past. Because if you just assume a purely uniformitarian cratering rate, you wouldn't get, even in 4.5 billion years, you would not get the current amount of craters on the moon. You wouldn't get it. So we, everyone agrees that the cratering rate must, must have been much higher in the past. And the secularists believe in two cratering eras, the early uh, bombardment and the late heavy bombardment. Uh, whereas I would say that could, that could have taken place during the creation leak. That could have been the process that God used to create these worlds. And the reason Earth lacks craters is because God made it with a different process. 
What about the craters that have happened since then? It's very easy to explain. There are asteroids out there. There are, in the smaller asteroids, the smaller, the more you have of them. There are very few large asteroids. And then there are, as you go smaller and smaller, you get more of them. And so you get ones that are about the size of a football. There are lots of those. And most of those, they come up, they burn up in the atmosphere, but every now and then one makes it through. And if it's larger than say a bus, it'll, it'll probably make it through and it'll impact. And we, it, it, it's, I think, consistent with the biblical time scale in the terms of the number of impacts that we've seen recently. Uh, it's consistent with the biblical time scale. So there really isn't a problem in terms of craters uh, for the biblical time scale. So when you're talking about <clears throat> the impact craters and everything, so is it safe to assume that what, what you're saying is these asteroids that are coming through are possibly creating craters and they're not extinction level events like what we've been led to right. believe? that they yeah. just cause some catastrophe, a lot of damage, but not necessarily extinction or radiation or anything like that. So nothing like Armageddon or anything, I should say. Uh, right. There was one that hit in Siberia um, a century ago that okay. it was pretty massive, but, but none, none that would cause a global extinction. Do you know how big that was in Siberia by any chance? I don't remember. Okay, but <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, where in Genesis six or seven, would you find scripture recording uh, the impact craters at that time? Or do you not believe some of the craters are from the flood period? They could be. And, and the Bible doesn't specifically mention them as far as I'm concerned. Um, and this is something that, that uh, this is an ongoing research project among creation scientists. Some would say that there was, that God used uh, a, a meteor stream to start the flood, and that has a certain attraction to it. Others would say, no, the, the, there wasn't really any increased cratering rate during the flood. So that's something that it depends on who you ask. Uh, I think Danny Faulkner would have an, one take on that. Wayne Spencer might have another take on that. They're both uh, qualified uh, guys. What do you who are very bright. I, I don't have, I'm not committed one way or the other. I really okay. am. I'm, I'm not. I, um, I haven't looked into the, what I, what, I, what I would want to do is I want to look to see if there are substantial number of meteorites in the geologic column. And that would help me to assess that. If there are a lot of meteorites in the geologic column, then that would, that would support the notion that there was an asteroid swarm associated with the flood, perhaps as a trigger for the flood. But if there are very few, and I think there are very few, then the, the uh, cratering rate might not have been any higher during the flood than it was at any other time. Can definitely I don't, and I don't know enough about the geology of it to know which of those is right. See, that's, that's one of the things I respect about you is you'll, you'll be honest, you'll be humble enough to say, you know what, I haven't necessarily researched it to the depths of some of these other people. And so you're not just going to go ahead and take a view without being the brand first and I'll looking yeah. at the research. So I, I appreciate that of you, brother. Uh, question. So first, is there evidence, is there actual historical evidence of the Ice Age? And if oh. so, where does the Ice Age fit within Scripture, and how can we see that from a 6,000-year-old point of view? Uh, yeah, it fits very nicely. There's even scriptural evidence of an Ice Age. We think that the Ice Age happened uh, shortly after the Flood and as a result of the Flood. Uh, a lot of people think that the Ice Age, that... First of all, the secularists believe there have been multiple ice ages. We don't find evidence for that. We find evidence for one. And uh, the secularists believe that these ice ages lasted millions of years. We don't find evidence of that either. We find evidence that they lasted a few, that the, the one ice age lasted a few hundred years after the flood, something like 700 years after the flood, depending on, and again, creationists use different numbers. I'm, I'm taking the, uh, the, uh, the Mike Ord figure, but th there are others out there. Um, it turns out people think well, people think that during the Ice Age, the world was just an icicle. It was just a frozen wasteland everywhere. Not true. During the Ice Age, there were portions of the world that were tropical, just like there are today. So what makes it an Ice Age? More ice than we have today. Today, about 10% of the Earth is glaciated. During the peak of the Ice Age, about 30% of the Earth was glaciated. So you have three times the number of glaciers that you have today. That's the Ice Age. How do you do that? People, people, again, assume, well, the, you just turn down the Earth's temperature a little bit. Turns out that will not produce an ice age. If you turn down the Earth's temperature, all you get is cold Earth. You don't get ice. To, need, to get ice, you need precipitation. 
and and that the, the circumstances to generate an ice age are exactly what the, the global flood provided because during the flood you've got all the fountains of the great deep bursting forth perhaps referring to underwater volcanic activity we think incredible amount of heat was added to the ocean and uh, of course water currents are very good at transporting that heat up and then there might have been uh, jets uh, jets that's that transported some of that heat to space but nonetheless the water is going to be very warm after the flood but Again, all the fountains of the great deep bursting forth, perhaps all the volcanoes on Earth going off, that's, that puts aerosols in the atmosphere. Today, when a major volcano erupts, Earth's temperature drops a little bit because the aerosols block some of the sunlight and that, that creates a cooling effect. And land will cool a lot faster than water will, which is why coastal areas tend to have very pleasant temperatures year round because the water stabilizes that. It, it has a very high specific heat. It retains heat very well. So after the flood, we'd expect warm ocean water, cool continents, and that is ideal for generating an ice age because what happens with the warm ocean water, you get lots of evaporation. And so you get very moist air. The moist air moves over the land, the land's cold. So that cools off the air and what happens? It can't retain the moisture and it snows, you get snowfall. Um, because of the aerosols, you're gonna have relatively cool summers. Because of the warm water, you're gonna have relatively warm winters. And that's what you need for an ice age, mild seasons. It actually would have been a very pleasant time to live on the earth, very mild seasons. And, and that's what you need because you, if you had real hot summers that the glaciers melt away, you need relatively brief, not quite so hot summers so that the glaciers can, um, can, can do their work. And then, uh, and, we, and of course, there's, I, we think there's biblical evidence for this. For one thing, Job, we think lived during the ice age. Job is a few hundred years after the flood. We think he's around 2000 BC, so it'd be 400, 500 years after the flood, something like that, close to the peak of the, the ice age. And uh, if, if there's more references to snow and ice in Job than any other book of the Bible, interestingly. So he was familiar with that. Uh, another, Abraham, we also think lived around this time. Abraham's around 2000 BC. And if you look at, um, remember the separation between Abraham and Lot, and Lot chose the, the good land that was down by Sodom and because he, he, he pitched his tent near Sodom the land is very green today. It's a desert and That's because during the ice age the, uh, the, the 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 cycles the seasons would have been a little bit different And so that was a very pleasant area to live in during the ice age So he, there is scriptural support that around this time is when the ice age happened It's the secularists that have a huge problem explaining how do you get an ice age because they, they don't believe in a worldwide flood And that's the that's the best way to do it. That's pretty fascinating because I think like one, one thing you said, a lot of times, and myself included, we get this idea that the Ice Age is a global icebox, if you will, as opposed to just a dropping of the temperature, cooler climates, environments. And you're right. I mean, I can't find, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't remember anywhere else in Scripture talking about uh, just the, the beauty and the treasures uh, of snow, if you will, and everything it, it, written in the book of Job and some of the other references and everything. So that's, I've never heard that before. So that's actually quite fascinating. So you've enlightened me on the ice age aspect. Uh, with all this and everything, actually our phone's ringing, so forgive me. <laughs> but with all this, why do you believe so many Christians succumbed to the evolutionary theory? And is it dangerous for the gospel? Uh, they get intimidated. The, uh, the Bible says the fear of man is a snare, or the fear of man brings a snare. Uh, it, it's, it's a common temptation in all of us. We get these, and I think also because we rightly respect the scientific method. It's a, it's a biblical, it's based biblically, the idea that God upholds the universe in a consistent way that we can probe by doing experiments. Uh, that's, that's a biblical principle. And you, so you have these brilliant scientists doing brilliant things, putting people on the moon, building computers that work. And it's just, it's astonishing what, what science has brought us. And people think when those same scientists speak to issues of the past, that they're speaking with the same expertise, that they're using the same method. They're not. At that point, the scientist has left his field of expertise. He's not doing testable, repeatable, observable results. He's speculating now in the past. People think that has the same kind of power that the scientific method has in the present. It doesn't. Uh, and so pe people get intimidated. They think, and, and the interesting thing is scientists get intimidated, which might be surprising to you, but I've had the opportunity to talk with a number of secular scientists throughout my career. And, you know, well, why do you believe in, in billions of years? Well, all the, all the other scientists believe in billions of years. And it's kind of interesting. 
yeah, or, you know, or, or they, but usually they, they won't appeal to their own field because they know that in their own field, the evidence isn't there. And so they'll say, well, yeah, but the other scientists believe in billions of years, so I have to interpret my data that way. And so it becomes a large sort of circular uh, argument. But uh, the root of, I mean, and, and there's a spiritual issue too, to be understood. The fact is that, that uh, God has revealed himself to everyone, but people suppress that truth and unrighteousness. And evolution in the Darwinian sense gives people a way of trying to account for life, existence, everything apart from the biblical God. And it is our sinful tendency to do that. So there is a, a secular motivation there. And there's, there have been some evolutionists that have been just very honest about that, that, you know, that we take the side of evolution in their sense, in spite of all the evidence, because we dare not, divi we dare not allow a divine foot in the door. And there have been some that have made, have, that have stated that almost, almost verbatim. So there is a spiritual issue. Does it affect the gospel? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, because if evolution is true, then death, you have death before sin, and therefore death is not the penalty for sin. And not only that, but you have other issues, too. Why is it that it had to, why did Jesus have to be, why did he have to be descended from Adam? To, you know, because God promised the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. Why does that have to be the case? Well, if you read biblical law, only a relative can redeem you. And so that's why Jesus, he's our blood relative. That's why his blood can count for us on the cross. So that's how we can be saved. That's why the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10. Unless evolution is true, in which case we are related to bulls and goats, and so why can't they take away sin? And so that doctrine is just gone if evolution is true, and, and many others as well. It just You basically undermine biblical history, and if that's undermined, then you don't have any rational basis for trusting the gospel. And I've heard it said before, and I think this was more of an Answers in Genesis thing that really promoted this idea, at least when I first heard it, was the first 11 chapters, understanding it literally is crucial to understanding the plan of God, the plan of redemption, uh, because if you succumb to an allegorical or symbolic view of those first few chapters, then the whole doctrines crumble, because you really find all the major doctrines within those first 10, 11 chapters. You really do. You know, marriage, for example, I mean, marriage is under attack in, the, in this nation, but if you're a biblical creationist, you'd say, well, no, wait a minute, marriage is one man and one woman united by God for life. You reject that in favor of evolution, marriage can be anything. And so we're now in, a, we're in this peculiar situation where we have a lot of people in this nation that have conservative values due to our Christian heritage, but because they've embraced evolution, there's, they have no way of rationally defending those values. You can't do it apart from a literal genesis. Otherwise, they use cultural uh, influences to ar argue why man and man or woman and woman or heaven forbid man and child, you know, which is another push that's been going on now lately. But that's more or less all with the craters and the young earth. I want to see if you can explain again. I, I'm a geek. I, I've told a lot of people about this. Uh, they don't nearly get as excited as I do with it. But the Mandelbrot set. Could you explain a little bit about what it is, how it points to God as the designer, and uh, just where can we find information in your lecture as far as breaking it down so that we can visually see the Mandelbrot set in action? What is it? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a set of numbers, and in math, a set is just a group of numbers that have something in common. Uh, the Mandelbrot set is defined by this little formula that uh, you put a number into it, you get another number out. You take that number that you, that you got out of it, you put it back into it again, you get another number out. You put it back in, you get another number out, and so on. You're, and you're, you, it, you do this forever. You don't have to do it forever to see what's happening. Either, this, either the result will get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, or it won't. It'll usually get smaller, or it'll oscillate between two values. And if the, if, if the result stays small, then the number that you're checking is part of the Mandelbrot set. And if it gets big, it's not part of the Mandelbrot set. So that's, that's kind of interesting. And uh, it, it's something that, you know, we nerds kind of like to, to look into. But uh, that was, that was a, that's called the, um, that's the uh, escape time algorithm. But in any case, during the 1980s, computers began to become fast enough where they could test numbers to see whether or not they belonged to the Malibu set very efficiently. And if we can do even better today, because computers are even faster. And some, some computer programmers found that if you make a map of which points belong to the Mandelbrot set, and it includes the so-called complex numbers, 
but which have a component that is the square root of a negative. If you've heard of imaginary numbers, they're not really imaginary, but that's what they're called. Uh, and, and you plot the imaginary component on the y-axis, the real component on the x-axis, and you make a map of which numbers belong to the Mandelbrot set. You might think, well, it'll be something like a circle or something like that. It's not. It's an incredibly complex shape. And the map itself turned out to be one of the most interesting discoveries of the 1980s. It was actually first plotted in 1978, but very re low resolution. And then they began plotting it in higher resolution in the 1980s. And if you think about, okay, what is causing this shape? What's the properties of numbers? And we, we don't tend to think about God creating numbers. We think about God creating trees and animals and things like that. But God is responsible for numbers. Maybe they're not created in the same way, but in the sense that numbers come from the mind of God. The reason two plus two equals four is because God thinks about it that way. That's why, that's why that works. And so when we plot the characteristics of numbers to see whether they belong to this formula, we get this incredibly complex shape showing that God has built into numbers incredible beauty and complexity. And the, the wonderful thing is when you zoom in on a section of the Mandelbrot set, certain sections of it will have a complete copy of the whole thing. It's like a baby version that looks almost identical to the original. And you can zoom in on a section of that and it'll have a baby version of the original itself. And you can do this literally forever. It has an infinite number of itself built into it, which is just wild to think about. But the thing that, that really was astonishing to me is that certain sections when you zoom in on it are unbelievably beautiful. You have these, these beautiful spiral shapes. I mean, it's not, it's not just sort of a random assortment of points. There is incredible beauty and organization built into the shape that no one was expecting because all you're doing is investigating to see whether a number belongs to the set or not and making a map of the result. And it's incredibly beautiful. So, and I think you really have to see it. So I actually did a uh, presentation on this. I, I wrote some computer software that would allow me to graph this quickly and so on. And I made a little presentation called The Secret Code of Creation. And uh, if, if people want to look at that, they can get it on our website, The Secret Code of Creation. I recommend the Blu-ray version. It's just, it's incredibly beautiful. It's incredibly beautiful. And the point is, there is no secular explanation for this. None. Because, you know, who, who created the Mandelbrot set? Well, it wasn't human beings. I mean, we defined the set, but we, didn't, we weren't expecting to find all this beauty when you plot it. We weren't expecting that. Somehow the beauty is built into numbers by the mind responsible for numbers. And that makes perfect sense in the Christian worldview because we have a God who is a God of beauty. He's rational, but he is also, he's also an artist and he is, he's built tremendous beauty into numbers. I mean, they were, it was always there. So they've been there since creation. But it wasn't until the 1980s that humans had the capacity to, uh, because of the advances in computers, uh, to actually be able to explore these shapes. And, so, and by the way, I've, got a, I've written a book on the topic too that'll come out hopefully early next year. So look, look for it around January. And it's gonna be kind of a coffee table style book where you can see these amazing shapes that God has built into numbers, uh, perhaps for our enjoyment and ultimately for his glory. And I, I'm really looking forward to that book coming out because I think it's the kind of book that people will, wow, this is amazing. And they'll, they'll, read, you know, they'll want to read about these amazing shapes. What are these? And they'll realize this comes from the mind of God. So they'll, read, they'll pick up this coffee table book because it's interesting and they'll get saved. That's my, uh, that's my goal anyway. Well, maybe I get the first or second copy of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's fat. The Valley of the Seahorses is one of my favorite yes. parts in the Mandelbrot set. Just seeing, and it's, again, just perfect, not only complexity, but repetition. It's like the other aspect of fractals. You know, I was talking with uh, one atheist about fractals and everything, trying to understand, okay, how does evolution account for perfect design, perfect symmetry of fractals? And the greatest answer I could get from him was bacteria. I don't know if you've heard of that explanation, but... Uh, matter of fact, your video, The Secret Code of Creation, I think is what it was called, is actually on the C4C Apologetics. I have a tab out there for the videos. Uh, it's not my videos, it's other videos that's been influential on me in the ministry. So you know, definitely check out his website, Biblical Science Institute, and Facebook and everything else. But if it's easier to navigate, you can find it on our channel, but make sure you give him the credit and everything else uh, for that. That's pretty much all the questions. Is there anything else you just want to close, say, as far as you? biblical creationism, impact craters, your ministry, anything at all? Uh, I just want to encourage folks, you know, I, um, in my career as a PhD astrophysics, astrophysicist, uh, I've not found anything that, 
that would challenge the Bible. And in fact, I expect science to work because the Bible's true. Uh, we have a God who upholds the universe in a consistent way. He does that for our benefit. And when we look out at the universe, we see evidence of design everywhere. It doesn't matter where you look. There's evidence of design everywhere, even in the way that God upholds his creation. These laws of physics that obey nice, neat mathematical equations like E equals MC squared, almost as if there's a mind behind them. And, of course, there is. And so I'd encourage folks to, uh, to check out our website if you can, biblicalscienceinstitute.com. It's a free website. You can check out the articles there. We do have a, uh, the only thing that's paid for, uh, paid for on the website is our forum, because that takes a lot of time for me to do. But the rest of it's free. Check out our articles on there. And uh, we do have some free videos. I have a podcast that you can, see, you can find at the bottom there. So a lot of fun. And, and am I mistaken, or are you actually active on the forum, answering questions yeah. and engaging with people? Yeah, yeah, I'm active on the forum, and that's why I made it, uh, that's why I made it, uh, that's the one thing where you can pay, for, uh, that you have to pay for, if you're a ministry partner, if you pay 20 bucks a month or more, you get access to that forum, and a lot of people just like to read it, and they don't, you know, maybe they're introverts like me, and they don't like to post, and that's fine, you know, but it's, it's a way that you can, if you want to ask me a question directly, I will, I will answer it, and uh, of course, some of, you can ask other people too, and, and sometimes I don't get involved in those, but um yeah, if you wanted to directly ask an astrophysicist, I thought that might be worth a little something. So there you go. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, again, brother, I thank you for just spending some time here on the channel and just being able to help us understand more clearly. Like you said, what does God's word say? You got to stand on the truth of scripture. You can't start from evidence, though I lean somewhat towards evidential apologetics. And I know you're very presuppositional. I think there's some legitimacy for all of them, depending on who you're reaching. But as long as we understand, we have to stand first and foremost on the biblical worldview, the biblical uh, truth of God's word, start from there and then move forward. Uh, so I thank you for just giving your insight as far as the impact craters and everything else, the Ice Age, Mandelbrot set. So if you haven't yet, like uh, Dr. Lyle said, check out Biblical Science Institute. If you're on Facebook, go ahead, ministry like. I think you also have like a public figure page as well for yourself. Yep. Uh, go ahead, like that, follow him. And a very humble guy. Uh, hopefully you can tell here. So thank you for checking in to C4C. Until next time, God bless.